So I would tell you, um, first of all, you should look around the room because every time I speak at an event, the room is filled. It's completely filled every time wall to wall. And yet, when I decided to speak on this topic, I heard from everybody, nobody's going to come to the session. I said, I'm not a vendor, so I don't care. <laughs> I don't care if they come to the session. But it's important to me to be able to stand up in our industry and say that we can make a change. And if women don't step forward and mentor other women and share success stories, none of us will ever get ahead, right? So I looked around the room this morning and I thought, wow, that's crazy. All these sessions that are choices and when we talk about women getting ahead in the business, it's such a finicky subject. I wondered how many men would attend this session because I thought if I was a man in this business, and a woman who was a social influencer on the rise was talking about something I would want to be present. So mad props to the one or two gentlemen that decided to come to the session today. I want to start out today by talking to you guys a little bit about what it's like to be a woman in the business. And I think we all know that we face some challenges. But it doesn't have to mean that we have to have a hate fest with the men or anything like that because changing a culture requires everybody to participate across the board. Okay, so I do love my boys in the business, um, but I'd love to see all you ladies getting farther and farther ahead, and that's important to me. I'm going to start out by showing you guys a quick video, and I'll apologize up front for the videos not playing in the slides. Uh, it's just something that happens. Okay. Now, some of you may have seen this video already. It was played during the Super Bowl, and I thought it had an extremely powerful message. And that we have a tendency in society to say things like, oh, she fights like a girl. What does that mean? Like, that's an insult to, to women, or, or she does that like a girl. And we've made it okay. And there's at some point during the transition between being a young girl and being a woman where we feel like it's all right to start to say that. And it's not. And we don't have to stand up. And, and I'll tell you, I'm all about women empowerment. I'm not a feminist, mostly because I can't commit to that kind of time requirement. But I'm not. And so I think these messages can be shared. And I think the importance of them can be felt. And that message can be put out into the world. And it doesn't have to be a hateful thing. So always came up with this Super Bowl commercial. And they featured little girls. And they featured women and men. And they put everybody in a room for an entire day. And then they came up with a one-minute clip about it. So I'm going to pull this up for you guys and show you real quick if it's going to allow me to do it, since it's not showing on the screen currently. Tell me what it looks like to run like a girl. We'll listen to it. Here. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aww. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah. So since you can't see this while they're talking, because this is what happens to me a lot. Um, My name is Dakota. He asked, they asked them to run like a girl, and they asked little boys. And little boys were like, you know, this is how a girl runs. They said, throw like a girl. Throw like a girl. And they're like, like this. Fight like a girl. They put women in this video. They put women in this video, our age, across the board. And when they put the women in the video, they did the same thing. That's a powerful statement. Then they went out and they got little girls, eight, nine, ten years old, and they said, run like a girl, and they ran as fast as they could. And they said, shoot like a girl, and they shot as hard as they could. And they said, jump like a girl, and these little girls were jumping for the sky. But at some point, society has taught you that it's an insult to do things like a girl. So I would challenge you to remember that there's nothing stronger in society than women. We make more, the majority of the buying decisions. We influence more things in a household than men or children. Extremely important to remember that as we go through this today, because one of the things I'm going to focus on today is confidence. And you have to have that backlit in order to function through that. Let me pull this back up. Could either one of you go grab the sound guy so he can fix the next video, because I'm going to need it. Make sure you guys can see this. No, let's not do that. <laughs> okay. So I love this show, right? So funny story. I, I'm going to share a little bit of my background as we kind of go through the um, session. But one of the things that you should know about me is that so I started in the business when I was 17 years old. I did not want to go to cosmetology, but I also did not want to go to class. 
So I had to find somebody that would employ me in the afternoons and teach me. So I went around to all these different places and I found a dealership and the dealership said, absolutely. And they made me work in every department of the dealership. I hated it. I remember pounding pavement and being like, so stupid. Now I look back and I'm so grateful because I learned all these different roles. So I went from being a um, part-time porter in the front to a salesperson, a sales manager, a sales director, a finance person, a finance director, then over to a general manager, a general sales manager before that. Then I went through some personal stuff with my husband and he said, if we're gonna save our marriage, you need to quit your job. And I was like, uh. But I did. I quit my job that day and I went to a company that needed a BDC person and I walked in and the guy said, were well, you really overqualified? And I said, I work really well with a commission plan, just write it up and let's do this. Right, so I go into that role and I tell you that because I want you to realize that if you're in a position right now where you're not happy with that position, whether it's the environment or it's that you don't think you can go anywhere, don't be afraid to start over. Because four years ago, I started over and I'm right back where I was before and it's not because I'm amazing, it's because I follow a couple different steps and I surround myself by really brilliant people. But this story is funny because when I decided to start all over and I went to that company and I said, write the pay plan, let's just do this. They said, okay, great, let's, you know, we're gonna do this. So I go out on the lot on the first day and I'm gonna take new inventory photos of everything because they were atrocious. So I go out and I put on pants and I don't, I'm telling you, I might own two pairs of pants. And it's not because I'm super girly, it's because I'm not a tiny girl and dresses hide everything. So there's a tip. So I wear dresses all the time. So the guy brings me into the office, the general manager, and he says, Bobby, I'm so sorry. I forgot to have you sign a form when you started. And I said, okay, and I'm thinking he's talking about like a pay plan form or something like that. So I go in and I sit down and he kind of looks at me and he says, um, here's the form and he slides it over. And it's a form that says, and I wish I was kidding when I tell you this, it says, women in our dealership aren't allowed to wear slacks. So sign this to say that you'll put on a dress. Now remember, it's like my second day and I wear dresses every day anyways, but I didn't wear a pair of dress the rest of the time I worked there. It wasn't happening. I wore slacks the whole time. So I thought this was funny because it's one of those identifiable things, right? And remember that as they're doing these things, a lot of times they don't even realize that they're doing it. It's not always an intentional situation, but it's not okay. Three days later, he comes into my office and he says, so we're having a weight loss contest. I'm like, that's great. I'd like a cupcake right now, but cool. So he says, you're gonna join, right? <laughs> what, no? So I was like, no, I don't wanna work out with you guys. Like, we're here all the time. So he says to me, he goes, well, no, I mean, cause you know, you need to. I'm like, well, are you gonna work out? Cause we're on the same level right now and I'm worried about your health too. But he never went to any of the guys in the dealership and did that. So I told him if he worked out, I would work out and we both decided synonymously we weren't gonna work out together. But I quit that day because I knew that regardless of the commitment that I made, no matter how hard I tried, it was never gonna be enough, okay? So I tell you this because I believe in confidence. I believe in positive energy. I think every morning when you get up, you should look at yourself in the mirror and you should say, I am amazing. Whatever it is that you like about yourself, love it. It doesn't have to be everything. My mirror in my bathroom or in my bedroom and my friends laugh sometimes has post-it notes all over. My entire team at work, every woman that I walk by, and I have 16 dealerships that I'm the sales and marketing director for. So everyone I walk in has post-it notes at their computers. People are always like, why are you putting post-it notes everywhere? And I think it's because we have a lot of critics in the world, but there are no critics that are harder on ourselves than we are, right? We're always looking for a balance. We're always saying to ourselves, you know, can I have it all? It's not a popular answer, but you can't always have it all at the same time. You have to prioritize and see what's important to you, but it is okay to remind yourself every day that you're awesome, okay? I would tell you graciously to stop being so hard on yourself. We are our own worst enemies. We believe that we need to be amazing at everything. Make every child's event, every game, every school play. If you're gonna expect yourself to be great at everything, that's okay, but you better love your job because it's a big commitment. And if it's not the right one for you, get a new one, okay? So people know I'm really big into this Boss Babe network. Um, I post a lot about it, it's not my company, 
but I love it. It's a lot of like silly little memes and quotes that you share with people. It's women who are out there saying, I want to be stronger and better all the time. And it's a great outlet to meet people for networking. So I do believe if you're going to rise, you might as well shine. Sorry, not sorry. This is something I really want to talk about with you guys. Um, and it's a shame that the videos aren't playing <laughs> because it's, we got Subi in the back who's always fixing my videos for me. Because there is one that I'd like to share with you, and hopefully they'll come in and fix it before the end. But if they don't, I want you to YouTube it. It's the Pantene ad, and it's sorry, not sorry. And what it runs through is that we as women have a tendency to say we're sorry all the time. We bump into somebody in the store and we go, oh, I'm sorry. We walk into an office and we say, oh, I'm sorry. Did you get that email? We go into another room and we go, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, you know. We apologize all the time. And it's not that it's not okay to apologize. It's that when you do it, you give a message of weakness. And so some of the things I say today, you might think in your head and you might go, that's ridiculous. And I'm okay with that. If you take one thing, I'm happy. Okay? We have to stop saying that we're sorry for everything. If you walk into an office and you say, oh, I'm sorry, I was just wondering if you could send that email to me. Don't walk in and say that. Drop the word sorry and drop the word just. Okay? Don't say those words anymore. I'm going to give you a good example. When a woman opens her window at 3 a.m. on a weeknight and shouts to a neighbor, can you turn the music down? I'm sorry, can you turn the music down? It's not an attempt at obtrusiveness. It's not even good manners. It's poor translation where you should have a string of expletives because who does that at 3 a.m.? These sorries are actually unassertive. Unfortunately for the addresser and the addressee, the assertive apology is too indirect. So we should stop. It's not what we're saying that's the problem. The sorry is taking up airtime that shouldn't be used. Okay, I really wish I could play this for you guys. It's that when you open that window, you should say, turn the music down, please. It's okay to add a please. Also, if you're going to be mean to somebody, smile and always end with bless your heart, especially if you're in the South. You could say whatever you want in the South if you just say, bless your heart, right? People are like, oh, she's so sweet. I'm going to shut up now. It happens. And it's the same thing with the email situation. If somebody should have sent you an email two weeks ago. It's not, I'm sorry, did you send me the email? It's walking in and saying, I need the email you were supposed to send me. It's a power word. And it is a display of dominance or weakness. Okay? Second thing is, I want you to drop the word just from your vocabulary. How many of you say this? Oh, I was just wondering what you were doing today. Oh, I was just checking in to see if you could send that to me. Oh, I was just seeing what our total goals are for the month. Just is a filler word. It's also a weakness word. Okay? It's what happens when you say that as a problem. It's the same thing as so. And I'm guilty of so. I say it all the time. I think it's a Michigan thing. But when people say, so, how was your day? No, just how was your day? It's a very powerful statement. I'm going to see, if this won't play for you guys, I am going to see if you can hear the audio on it. It's only one minute long, so it won't take long for you guys to at least hear it. But I think it's important. Let's see here. Sorry, can I ask a stupid question? So listen for the differences Sorry. and relate this to your everyday. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, there he is. My squeeze in here. Sorry. 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 Do you recognize moments where you do this throughout the day without even realizing it? Sorry. Go first. Don't be sorry anymore. Listen to these same women in the same situations. It's going to flip for you. Same message, stronger. I have a question. Why don't we go back to the original thing that we did? Morning. So how many of you can hear in those statements times when you say that during a day and don't even realize that you're doing it? it? Happens all the time. And I'm guilty of it as well. So don't think that when I say this stuff, I don't have my own things. Here's another favorite thing of mine um, and something I really want you to think about. This is a powerful quote that's used all over the internet. And it's look like a girl, act like a lady, think like a man, work like a boss. And people quote this, and we say it all the time, and we post it all the time, and we repeat it all the time, and we say things because it makes us feel powerful. But that's not a powerful move, because if you're distinguishing yourself in the business as a man or a woman, that's your first mistake. 
You don't have to be a powerful woman. You have to be a powerful person. I don't want to be the number one woman in automotive. I want to be the number one in automotive. I don't need the fact that I'm a woman to define me, but I do recognize that there are some things that I have to overcome and some adversity and some challenges, and the same for you ladies, that you don't have, that, that men don't have, that they have to go through. So change that in your mind. The next thing I would tell you is, you got to raise your hand. You have to sit at the table. You have to say that you want it. And you have to show why you should get it. Way, way too often, way too often, a job or a promotion will come up, and we'll mention it to somebody, but we don't raise our hand. We don't say, I want this. One of the best TED Talks I've ever seen, and somebody that I idolize completely, uh, is Cheryl from Facebook. If you have not seen her TED Talks or read her book, read it. She tells this incredible story about how she's in New York, Right? And she's pitching a deal at a huge firm for Facebook. It's all men at the table. She gets up because they're taking a break. Everybody's going to go to the bathroom. And the president of the company says to her, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. She says, what? And he says, I don't know where the ladies' restroom is. She says, you've been here for two years and there's never been a woman at this table? And he said, no, I'm sorry to say there's not. That's incredible. So she talks about how she, as a woman in power, has this meeting, and she has a whole audience full of people, and she says to them, you know, I'm going to take questions for five more minutes. And I think this is really powerful. She says, five more minutes I'm going to take questions for. So she starts taking the questions. She says, two more minutes. And she notices at the end of the two minutes that all the women in the audience put their hand down, and all the men kept their hand up. And it wasn't until a student came to her after the session and said, hey, I just wanted to let you know that when you said two minutes, I put my hand down but none of them ended, and you continue to ask, answer questions. And she says, and it's so powerful, she says, if I, as a woman who am paying attention to that, didn't catch that, how is anybody else supposed to? So when you want something, you got to remember to raise your hand. It is that simple. I'm going to tell you a, a little difference again between men and women. People with me, I'm a very strong personality, very direct, I don't sugarcoat things. But I do like to know my audience. And people either love me or they hate me, right? There's a very limited gray area in my life. Um, but that's because if you took a poll, and actually in 2015, Harvard University did a poll, the only thing they changed in the story was they changed the person from Herman to Susie. They put out a poll on Herman, and they talked about what kind of leader he was and what his traits were and what kind of person he was. And people loved it. They said, oh, I'd love to work for him. He sounds like a great guy. Change one thing, the name to Susie, and everybody says, oh, she sounds like she'd be a bitch to work for. Same person. It's the perception that was the difference. And I tell you this because you'll see that in the audience. Those traits shouldn't be different, but they are. So sometimes we have to soften the blow a little bit. Okay? Here's the second thing I'll tell you because we work in automotive, and, and I'm okay with the judgment on this one, but sometimes you just got to be okay with stuff you're not okay with. Okay? I don't mean that you should put up or tolerate things that cross a line for you. So disclaimer there, if you feel like a situation is inappropriate, you should see your supervisor, now that we did that part. Um, we work in a very male-dominated industry. We work in an industry where some people find things humorful, where other people find them offensive. It's okay to remove yourself from the situation, and those guys should definitely get their act together. But if you want to be on the golf course during the meetings that you get you the promotion, you've got to lighten up a little bit. That's part of it. There's a little bit of humor involved in everything. And again, I say, it doesn't have to cross a line. But it does have to be comfortable for them. Women always say to me, oh, you golf? I don't golf. I'm the worst golfer in the world. It's terrible. But I learned how to golf just good enough to get on the course because I want to be present for the meetings where people get promotions. And if you believe that doesn't happen, it definitely does. Okay. Here's the other thing. I want you to start thinking about just saying no. And I know that the things I'm telling you right now seem simple, and you're probably thinking in your head, well, I already knew that. But simple is simple unless you don't execute it. It doesn't matter. So if you think about it's Christmas time, right? The dealership's adopted a family, or your agency's adopted it, and I love that about people, right? But you think about who did they come to to get that stuff wrapped? Who picked up lunch on Thursday? And it's okay to pick up on lunch on Thursday, but Joe Blow better be picking up lunch on Wednesday. You have to start saying no. 
It's an emotional thing. It's not your fault. We as women are emotional people, and we want to help, and we want to be kind. Plus, it's kind of fun to wrap Christmas presents, right? But when you do that, when you continue to do that and you never say no, it's not helping you get the promotion. It's helping you be identified as a secretary, and I don't mean that in a negative way because our secretaries are way smarter than me sometimes, and they do a ton for me. But it's identifying you as a person who's not raising their hand. Okay? Say no. It's okay to do that. I want to talk to you for a minute about playing to your strengths. Um, as much as I joke and I say I'm overdosed on confidence, and I usually am, I know that I'm not great at everything in life, and that's the key to this. You have to know what you're good at and what you're not, and don't lie to yourself. If you're not good at it, find somebody who is. Hire people you don't like. Because when you like the people that you hire, they're typically like you. Take yourself out of your comfort zone in situations like that. Work next to people you don't like. Challenge yourself to make a new friend that you didn't really like. I'm going to share with you a quick story. Um, and I think this is funnier than she does. But in the front of the class talking right now is my best friend. We call her my hashtag vein chick. She's super supportive. She should be in another session learning right now, but she's here. Yeah, I did. That's why you're on here. So, but I tell you this because she used to work in my market, and I hated her. She killed it. I think I'm really good at a lot of things in life, but there's a lot of things I'm not that she is. And she was kicking my ass in my market. So I'm like, she needs a new resume. <laughs> so I took a little trip to her LinkedIn page. I'm not saying you should do this. I'm telling you this is a weakness of mine. And I made her a new resume. And I sent it out everywhere. Now, the recruiter that ended up calling her probably didn't get a resume from me. I'm not sure. But on her own merit, she's wicked brilliant. And so she took this new job an hour outside of my market. It was beautiful. They haven't been able to replace her since. It's the kind of stuff that I do. But what I learned was, once I got to know her, we're not the same. My strengths are her weaknesses, and her strengths are mine. So I found a mentor, I found a best friend, I found a person who I never would have walked up to and challenged to be a part of things with me because we were so different. So I say to you to challenge that and find somebody who challenges you. When I talk about your strengths, I want you guys to think about uh, what's called a SWOT analysis. And it's typically used for businesses, but it's a really good way to determine what your strengths are. How you do this is so you just quick Google SWOT analysis. And what it's going to do for you is it's going to give you four core things about yourself. And you're going to be honest with yourself. Don't do it around other people. Probably do it when you're drinking. That's probably a better choice. It's a little more comfortable that way. But it identifies for you areas where you have the improvement and where you're losing things versus where you don't. And don't look at positions that you're not right for because it's a promotion. I, I always tell people that I mentor and I tell my teenage daughter this very same thing. Everything in life is only hard until it's easy. That's why we practice. Nothing's really that difficult. You just have to practice it. The other part of it is we shouldn't ever be making permanent decisions for temporary problems. If you want the title or you want the office and you want it because you want it, then you should raise your hand. If you want it because it's a stepping stone, raise your hand. Suck it up for a while and do it. But if you want it for the wrong reason, if you want it because it seems like it will be fun, or if you're like, man, they make a lot of money, that's great, but it doesn't stick, and you will burn out. Because you are not only working every day, you're fighting an industry. You're fighting adversity every day on those things. So I want you to really keep that in mind. And do this SWOT analysis. Um, <laughs> so I'd like everybody to shut your eyes for just a minute. It's two seconds. We're going to play this game. If you don't shut your eyes, I'm going to make you come on stage and sing I'm a Little Teapot. And I specialize in making people do things they don't want to do. All right. I want you to think about one career goal and one life goal. And I want it to be short term. Something you can change in the next year of your life that you can execute in six months, strategize and implement, and come back with. So once you have that, open your eyes. Today, when you came in, you should have swiped a badge. If you didn't, please do it on your way out. And I'm going to ask you this because I want to personally follow up with you in six months. I want to find out if you did something about those things and if you changed something. Every time I hire somebody new, the first thing I ask them is, what are their personal goals? Because the work-life balance is so important. 
Last year, I had a girl say to me, I want to buy a house. I said, well, let's buy a house then. What do we got to make? Let's reverse engineer this. You know what she did last week? She closed down her house. She's a single 24-year-old girl that works in a BDC for me. Same thing with another one of my employees last year. What do you want to do? I want to get married. I've been with my boyfriend for seven years. And he won't ask me, all right, let's make that shit go down. So personal goals are aligned with career goals. And I mean it when I say, do something about that. Okay. So here's the next one. And this is probably one that um, gets me in trouble. But, and this is my favorite quote, don't let the pretty face fool you. I roll like a boss. <laughs> because I like expensive things, and I'm very independent, right? But nobody handed that to me. I work on commission, and I work really hard. Establishing dominance is a huge part of things. So I want you to think about the last time you were at the bar or in a social gathering with women, and they didn't know each other. So they have a drink, they start hanging out. What's the next thing that happens? Flood of information. How quick can we bond? What do we have in common? And that's okay. That's what we do. But I challenge you to watch a group of men who've just met each other. Because men, where they're different than women in that, is that they, uh, they go tit for tat on facts. Right? You ever watched a power play between two guys? I find great humor in it. Watch it today. I promise it'll happen. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Learn from it. Because what we need to learn how to do is do this blend. We're emotional. We start talking and bonding. We overshare. We spill information. We're like, oh, you have a kid? I have a kid. Oh, you play soccer? I play soccer. And it's everything kind of together, right? So where this is different and where men tend to do is they go tit for tat on those facts, blend that. Bond with people in a way that is factual. Stop talking about how you share the favorite lipstick or your favorite shade and start talking about facts that are professional for you. Sometimes in networking, we have to be reminded that it is a business-oriented thing, right? Watch it tonight, though. I promise you're going to see it and you're going to happen. I want you to think of it as the equivalent of the animal world, okay? Does anybody have a dog? You know what dogs do when they make new friends? They run around sniffing each other's butts. It's terrible. <laughs> Tit for tat. Watch it tonight. It will go down. Um, women excel in emotional areas, listening, sympathy, empathy, and socializing. Use those strengths to your benefit. Establish and create relationships within your workplace. We're going to talk a little bit in a minute about mentoring versus sponsoring. Okay? Make sure your efforts don't go unnoticed. Big one. Executive presence is one of my favorite things. If you've ever been in a room and somebody with executive presence walked in, you knew it. You don't even have to know them. They walk in and everybody's like, oh my God, hey. Right? Everybody's looking, everybody's paying attention. That is executive presence. It starts with a couple key things that you don't even realize that you do. So the first thing is called a power pose. Right? So if you're feeling like you're intimidated, that's okay. If you're feeling small in a room full of people, that is okay. But you're not going to be comfortable sitting at the table until you don't feel that way. So I tell you, one of the research studies that was done this year um, by a social psychologist, which I thought was fascinating, is they took people into a room and they had them just sit naturally. So everybody pay attention to how you're sitting right now. Just think about it. Don't change it. Just think about how you're sitting right now. Okay? So what they said was, if your body is small, then you're intimidated or not comfortable. If you're leaning in, if your arms are tight, if you're like this, anything like that. And it's okay if you're like that right now. You'll notice that people with an executive presence are big, right? Big arms, walking in. I have this fascination with Wonder Woman, and I didn't come up with that name. Somebody in the industry did. but. The Wonder Woman is a powerful pose. It looks like this, right? What this is, is it's your body stretching out and being powerful. It's your back upright. It's your chin up. It's like, yeah, that's right. I've got this. If you're going to an event and you are a person who is intimidated by something, for two minutes, pick a crazy power pose. It can be leaning back on a chair with your feet on the desk stretched out. It can be a yoga pose. It doesn't matter. And I tell you this because I didn't make this up. This study came out, they actually hooked people up to little brain monitors, <laughs> and it showed that after two minutes, you can change your own mind, right? You don't have to fake it till you make it, you can fake it till you become it. You have to retrain yourself to do these things. 
Be a stiletto in a room full of flats. I love stilettos. It's a thing for me. I'm also going to walk around this conference all day today in flats as soon as we exit this session. Because <laughs> I don't need to be dominant all day, but I need to be able to walk tonight. Here's the second thing. Stop talking like a valley girl. Stop using words that make you sound uneducated. And here's why. I can say the same thing to you in a valley girl way. I could be like, and I talk like that a lot, just not at work. So I could say to you like, oh my God, this weekend was like crazy. I had to work all weekend. I had to like do that. Or I can say to you, wow, this weekend was crazy. I had so much work done. Same statement, different presence. Okay. These are from filler words. These are from intimidation. This is where I'm saying drop the word just. Words that are filler words are not okay. Um, the next thing is be assertive but not aggressive. When I say to use dominance in your day, I don't mean to be a jerk, okay? We don't want to be treated that way and neither does anybody else. What I mean by that is be assertive in what you're trying to accomplish, but don't be an ass. It's okay to balance that. One of the things that's made me very successful in my career, unfortunately it should be because I'm smart, <laughs> but is that I piggyback and I don't speak first. If you catch me in a room, especially in a meeting, whether it's a Monday morning, whether you're with a client and you're a vendor, whatever it is, when you're the first person to speak in a situation, you open yourself up to be the person who is attacked. Whether you're right or wrong is irrelevant. If you allow another person to speak first and you piggyback off of what they say, you ask questions while they're doing it, it changes the perspective all of a sudden you're the one who came up with the idea, okay? So let's talk about an example, which would be, let's say you're sitting at a table or you're with a, you're with a client, whatever it is, and the idea is that you wanna say something like, you know, the SEO that should be on your website, you need this, right? You can start out by saying that, or if you let them talk first, you can start to ask questions. If you know me at all, you know I ask a lot of questions. Sometimes I'm asking because I don't know the answer, and sometimes I want you to know that I already know the answer, but I need you to come up with it so that you're bought in. It's less important for me that I have a great ego and that I'm right all the time and more important for me that everybody does what I want them to do. And that's part of creating buy-in. So let them talk first, right? Which brings us to our, our next point. Agree even when you don't. Right, that's a crazy one. You're like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't mean you have to switch sides. What I mean is you have to empathize. So when somebody says something dumb to me, instead of me going, that's really dumb, I say something back to them like, Wow, so I can appreciate, why, why do you think that? Giving them a chance to explain. I don't listen to reply, I listen to listen. So then I might say to them, okay, well, what do you think about if you did this? I didn't just come up with it, that was my point the whole time, but I want them to say it. They will recognize that it came from you, I promise, in their head they will know that it was your idea. But what will happen, and this is men or women, it doesn't matter. What will happen is, all of a sudden you're brilliant. Like, oh, yeah. People like to feel good. People who know how to do well with people make other people feel good, right? We compliment, always using a, uh, we call it the, the compliment sandwich, right? If I'm gonna say something that I think needs to be changed, like I might say to Jennifer, I might say, I love your hair. Did you get that spreadsheet done? You did such a good job on that. Hey, uh, line A with the question mark, the formula. What do you think about if we change that to blah, 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 blah? Okay, okay, great. Hey, keep up the good work. And I walk out. Jennifer's like a whiz with formula, so that's just funny. But um, the reason that that worked and Jennifer will change the formula is because I recognized in a responsive, timely manner the effort that is put in. I recognized what she was trying to do, and I didn't attack what I didn't like about it. I asked the question so she could come up with the answer, and then I walked away with a warm and fuzzy feeling, right? You're doing a great job, but it will change that behavior. That's why when we're talking to people or we're working our way up in this business, in any business really, don't make statements, ask questions. It is a powerful, small change you can make in your day. At some point today, try it. Like when somebody says something that you're like, Change your face real quick. Change the channel in your head and change your face. And ask the question in a way that will make them respond the way that you wanted to say to them in the first place. Okay? 
I'm going to talk to you about networking. I've been coming to conferences for years and years and years. The most powerful thing I ever decided to do was network. I used to be the girl that came to the conference and went upstairs and worked all night, because I'm a bit of a workaholic. But I used to do that, and then I realized I was missing out on meeting the most important people in our business, the social influencers, the people who are building products, the people who are working on the ground every day in a dealership, and I wasn't taking the time to learn from them. Sure, I come to sessions all day and I learn things and I hope that I take something back, but I wasn't taking the time to change my life. So I switched that and I said, you know what, I'm a friendly person, I like to make friends. I can work on just Tuesday while I'm here. I'm not saying you shouldn't work while you're here, just do it for like two hours. But what it did was it changed everything. Three years later, products are built with our opinions. We go on to dealer advisory boards and people think that I do that because it's fun and I get to take trips. I do that because I want a voice in the product that's being built for me tomorrow. And I want it to matter. And I sit at these tables in these vendor groups and I sit there and I'm the only girl. There's maybe one or two other every once in a while and I think to myself, there's no way that this should be so off balance. But part of it is that networking. Part of it is going out and meeting people. Now there's a couple different ways that I mean to do this, um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the auto fam. Um, but start here. So if you're on Facebook, there's a million different forums that you can join, right? There's tons, there's like 18 of them that I belong to that have some of the craziest, smartest people in the business in these forums. And they're talking about business and they're asking questions and everybody's kind of meeting up and doing things. Um, stiletto networks, are any of you familiar with the stiletto network? Okay, so cool. A stiletto network is a group of women, and it can be a group of men as well, who meet up for lunch or dinner once a week. It's 10 to 12 people, no more than 12, and it's people in and outside of your industry. They don't have to be in automotive, and they shouldn't be people that you're already friends with, maybe like on a knowing level. You could probably build one while you're here. Here's the rule. You go to dinner every week. You're only allowed to spend 30 minutes talking about family. That's it. Everything else is business. And the reason that it's not all automotive is that you shouldn't be looking for mentors and guidance just in your business. We should be looking outside of it at what people are creating because leadership and getting ahead has nothing to do with the business you're in and everything to do with the way that you communicate and the presence that you have. If you don't have a stiletto network in your area, you should Google this, you should create one. And every one of you came to this class today which means that you wanted to know how to be able to get ahead in this business or any in a male-dominated industry, there's your first step. Create a group that will support you. Industry events like this one. Go out tonight. Go to the party. Get into an uncomfortable situation. Walk up to a stranger, everybody's got badges, and introduce yourself. Don't be afraid to do that. And if they're talking business and you don't want to, that's okay. Say, you know what, it's nighttime, I don't want to talk business, let's talk about something else. Tell me about this, tell me about that. All you're doing is establishing an initial relationship. Okay? So, we talk about online the auto fam. And a very good friend of mine, Brian Armstrong, is another dealer who um, I've presented with before and I think is a really great guy. His wife got very sick this year. It was never as powerful to me what the auto fam stands for until the day that somebody in our auto fam created a GoFundMe account in a Facebook group called hashtag CarStrong. So you're going to see people walking around this conference with these t-shirts. These are people who stood up and maybe it was a dollar, maybe it was two dollars, maybe it was two hundred dollars that stood up and said I want to help him. Their reach has been over twenty thousand dollars. All from auto people. I tell you that story because that is how strong the network is that you can build to surround yourself with, okay? So, <laughs> in true fashion, <laughs> my stuff never works. Okay, join those groups, start talking to those people. The another thing I wanna tell you is, without the slides and we'll just have a quick conversation, is that in a setting where something happens like your slides go out, don't panic. Don't stop. It's going to happen to you every day in business. Somebody's going to throw something in your face and you're going to have to figure out how to deal with it. 
smile, adjust your tone, and use what I call the AIM method. You acknowledge it, you ignore it, and you move on. And you deal with it later when you can, right? Or in that moment. But that's an important part of it, is that smiling part. I smile a lot. I love positive energy, and I love to surround myself with people who are super positive. If you've ever noticed you go to a lunch, you go to a dinner, and somebody's complaining about their job, what happens? You start thinking in your head like, oh, I don't like my job either. <laughs> I don't like that either. That's negative energy, and it's contagious. So stop it. Take yourself out of that situation. You can say something to somebody with smiling versus non-smiling, and it'll have a completely different message. I can say to somebody, oh, I don't like that guy. Or I can say, I don't like that guy. Right? Same thing, same message, different delivery. Makes a huge difference in, in any aspect, really. It's the same thing with your tone of voice. So when you're presenting or you're talking, especially if you want somebody's attention, speak in bursts, right? Have an entire statement, pause, deflect to the next thing, ask a question, okay? It's really hot in here, isn't it? We're working up the heat. Are we, give, are we giving up on this? Ah, oh, okay. It's fine, we don't need it, it's okay. To recap what we're talking about, here's what, here's what I'd like you to do today so that you know that what we talked about today was legit. Step outside of your comfort zone and meet with one person that you didn't think you were gonna meet with, right? Somebody that makes you uncomfortable. When you talk to them and they're gonna say something you're not gonna like because we just decided somebody you're not really comfortable with, ask the questions, pause. It seems very simple. But if you want to be a strong, powerful person in this business or any other business, you have to demonstrate that presence. It's such a big aspect of it, okay? Don't forget about the stiletto networks. I'm serious about this goals thing. People, people have a tendency to create goals based on months, right? We do it in automotive all the time. We go, I gotta get 30 cars this month. I gotta, I gotta have a 265 car payment. Do you get paid monthly? <laughs> you don't. But we do that. We program ourselves to say that everything has to happen in a month-long thing. It doesn't. If you really want to get ahead or do something, raise your hand, sit at the table, break those goals down into micro goals. Try to accomplish things in a week, not a month. You can't adjust it if you wait a month. It's too long. You have to go into something and say, it's been a week and it didn't work. Great. Let's reevaluate and move on. The most important thing that I could ever tell you would be to check your ego at the door. I am not the smartest person in the world. It took me a long time to be able to say that out loud, though. Thank God for posty notes. But I'm not. I surround myself with brilliant people because friends are like elevators, right? They can take you up or they can take you down. Whatever ride you choose to go on is where you're going to land, okay? So be a powerful person in our business. Thank you for being outside of the norm and deciding to attend this session. My information can be shared on the stuff, and I would really like to reach out to you. So my information was on my slide deck. My Twitter handle is at sign on the line. I am the digital sales and marketing director for Garber Automotive. You can reach out to me anytime if you need help, if you have questions. I believe in mentoring people. So I think today you should start to look for a mentor. And one of those things that you're going to say is, and we'll wrap this up after this, is don't walk up to somebody and say, hey, you want to be my mentor? Because that's weird, right? It's awkward. Instead, walk up and start a conversation. Find somebody you're uncomfortable with. Mentors should not sugarcoat things for you. They should praise you in public and they should criticize you in private. They should back you 100% of the time when they see you publicly. And in private, they should be comfortable saying, what were you thinking? Because we all have those moments where we need that check. I call on my friends in my tribe a lot to fix things for me. I will reach out and say things like, all right, will you review this and see what you think? And I have to check my ego because it's not always right. I have to have people who say to me, you really shouldn't do that, or what were you thinking? And you need that too. The second part of that is the sponsor part. So a mentor and a sponsor are different. A sponsor is somebody within your own company that believes in you and that will back you and that will help you grow. And if you don't have that, it's the most important thing that you can have because you have to be your own cheerleader a lot, but you do need somebody behind you saying, oh yeah, did you think about her for that? Oh yeah, did you think about this? So a mentor and a sponsor are very different. Mentors, sponsors, and networking. So expect to see everybody at the party tonight and have an uncomfortable conversation, right? That's all for today. I think I had more on my slides, but who knows? <laughs> so we'll end it with, uh, I'll see you all at the top, and I appreciate you choosing to come to the session today. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Mm. I will take some questions. Right. Get them out of the box? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So the question was, if you didn't hear it, how do you encourage women in their own environment to raise their hand? Is that pretty much the question? Okay. The biggest part of it is praise. That's the biggest part of it. It's saying to somebody, you did a good job. We joke and we say, like, oh, millennials, they need a pat on the back. Oh, they need a trophy. Uh, when you work hard, it feels good to have somebody say, hey, you did a good job. And we often forget to do that, especially if you've been in the business for a long time and you weren't grown in the business that way, right? So that, um, I always try to make a really comforting environment. I do one-on-ones with my teams um, every month. I'd like to say I did it more often, but I have big teams and I can't. And during those one-on-ones, I'm asking them about goals and how I can help them, not criticizing. If I'm going to criticize, it's a very short part of it, and it happens in the middle. I think that the easiest way to let women know that, and, and men too, to let people, anybody know in a business that they need to raise their hand is to make them comfortable, because that's the hardest part about it. Yeah. And women are good at seeing if somebody is being dishonest. or um, And customers love women. If you've seen any of the recent studies, we're like 90% more trustful, right? I made that number up. It might be 70. Yeah. Right. It's scary. Commission sales is scary. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's that's a great question. You know they have the capability, they're trustworthy, they're they're more loyal, they're yeah. really gonna tell them concern. Yeah. Do you do you think that happens because they're fearful of it? Yeah, I I don't know. I appreciate that answer. So here's one of the things that we do with women that we found works really well in an environment is we've kind of changed it up a little bit and we've said, what are we comfortable paying somebody? Like for example, in sales, who sells eight cars a month, 10 cars a month. And we've said, we're gonna lower the commission amount and give a salary. We're not losing anything. We're just working with somebody's comfort level. Also, instead of saying, we're gonna put a $200 spiff on this car sale, we say, you don't have to work on Saturday. You don't have to work on Tuesday. It didn't cost me anything more, but the key is I don't get to bitch about it later. I don't get to say on Wednesday, well, you had Tuesday off. Ah. Like, you can't do that, right? But spiffs like that, things that you're putting out to women to make them want to come into the environment. We have a pretty good retention of women in our dealerships, and it was a struggle for a long time. And we started figuring out things like a woman is not going to get a commission check when she has children or has responsibilities and go out and buy herself a new coach purse. We just don't operate that way. So one of the things that you can do for your staff is to say, and I use a coach purse's example because I love purses, but you can say, I'm gonna put a $200 spiff on that. It's coming with a uh, coach gift card. Little tweaks, little things that change it because we don't do that stuff for ourselves enough, a massage, whatever it is, something that we can't do for somebody else that has to be used for us. So, so some little tweaks like that, te technically difficult wise will help. Also split shifts, things where they can get a balance. Um, a person who needs a split shift or a balance isn't any less committed or successful than somebody who's willing to put 90 hours in a week. They just need a different kind of balance. And we are very bad in our industry about making sure that we do that for people. About saying, well, you worked 90 hours, so you must be the hardest worker in the bunch. No, you're not. You're just not as efficient as me, because I'm working 50, right? It's probably not true, but feels good to say it like that. But yeah, that's the thing. Just kind of flip some things like that. Any other questions? I know we don't have a lot of time. No, that's okay. It's fine. 
So when you're engaged in things with him, how long have you been there? Oh, you've been there for six years? Okay. Is he the kind of guy that is intimidating to the other salespeople? No. To other guys? Do you have any other women on your floor? No. Okay. I would say that probably at some point in time, you watched him shut something down, whether it was from you or somebody else. And he sounds like he's a pretty successful guy. He probably has a really large presence about him that can be intimidating. There's so many different reasons that that could be happening to you. What I would do to fix it, though, is I would say to myself every day, so come up with some different things you can have a conversation about every day that are very short and pointed. Stop into the office to see him, to talk about him. Don't sit. Stay standing. Have that executive presence. Have a brief conversation. Exit. Every day, make that a little bit stronger. It takes 21 days to form a habit. It takes about 15 days to overcome the intimidations of somebody else's presence. Wow. Okay? You. Yeah, you're welcome. Definitely. Anybody else? All right. You guys are going to miss your next session if you don't get moving, so I don't want to hold you.